everybody. What's going on? You're watching The Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixsmith. Avi Belkin is here with us. He's got his brand new film. Mike Wallace is here. Thanks for coming here. Thank you, man. First of all, congrats on the film. Thanks. Checked it out last night. I mean, wow. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack with Mike Wallace. So this was a, a long time coming for you. So what was it like seeing it all together now? It's amazing, man. Just the process of doing a documentary is so rewarding, I would mm -hmm. say. You start with this idea in your head, and then you go through just hours of hours of footage and then to kind of narrow it down to something that's actually working as a film it's amazing you told me you took 15 hours of footage and it made it 90 minutes yeah and i watched for months <laughs> months just watched interviews and would write down little notes mm. and stuff and ideas that i had uh, it just took a lot of work uh, this was the first time that cbs kind of opened up their vaults yeah. of 60 minutes in the archive so i kind of took advantage of that yeah that, that, that's just, a rare thing it is a rare thing and i just kind of said like yeah bring it on and mm. i was just watching those raw interviews and every time we see a story in 60 minutes it's usually like 12 minutes right but the interview is like five hours there's so much more yeah exactly yeah. and then you're like watching those interviews was like amazing mm. just not only the, the materials but also seeing mike work you know, you're doing interviews, I'm interviewing yeah. people as well. Mike was amazing, and he was just relentless. You can see him in those interviews, even between the outtakes, he was just so focused. He, he was, was really locked in. Locked in, never yeah. break anything. Always had like a, a stack of uh, yellow papers on him that he was doing, you know, research notes on, and was just really a, a, a professional. Definitely. So how did you come into all this in terms of the idea <laughs> and just in terms of putting this thing into a doc? So I was living in Tel Aviv mm -hmm. three years ago. I'm from Israel. And this was before Trump got elected. Right. But it already felt back then that like journalism was in trouble. Absolutely. Yeah. And this was after Spotlight won the Oscar. Mm -hmm. And it was very much in debate. Where is journalism going and what's going to happen? And I became obsessed with the question, how did we get here? And I started basically researching the Genesis story of broadcast journalism, and Mike was kind of like a zealot character, a Forrest Gump I'm character. I'm sure he was in there a lot, yeah. Every <laughs> fucking test of the way, he was kind of in the point, right? Yeah. And then I had this idea, if I'm doing a portrait of Mike Wallace, I can tell the broadcast journalism story through him. So I bought a plane ticket and came to America. Wow, and, and what had your background been in terms of watching old Mike Wallace stuff, or just, just your knowledge of him in general? So growing up in Israel, we had illegal cables, mm -hmm. so I used to watch 60 <laughs> Minutes sometimes, you know, so I knew who he was, right. but not real in-depth. But no idea the type of man, reporter, nothing, and Nothing about his depression or right. his commercial background and all those stuff that the film kind of mm -hmm. shows. But again, like doing the research, you're starting to open up a scope about a person, and then I just, you know, kind of discovered more and more into his story, and I felt just like this is an amazing story yeah I mean you really painted the broad picture in terms of who he was so like you mentioned like he's doing these commercials and he's a yeah. spokesman never in a million years did I think that but we were talking about it off camera like guys were just trying to make a buck back then but it is still pretty surprising to me that he was doing that stuff beforehand 100% surprising I, I won't take away but I will give two contexts into mm -hmm. that one Mike grew up in the Great Depression right the Great Depression influenced the entire generation. Everybody felt like the ground can be dropped under their feet at any given moment, and if you have an opportunity to make a buck, you go Take for it. it. Yeah. Exactly. And the second thing is, there was just a culture back then of doing everything. You know, newscasters back then was, were jack of all trades. They used to do, you know, news announcements and readings of uh, dramatic plays and stuff like that. So Mike was basically a jack of all trades in his beginning, and then, little by little, he started to kind of find his way into that reporter, journalist role. I gotcha. So, you mentioned before, pre-Trump, where journalism is now, where you start the film is really interesting yeah. because it's Mike Wallace and Bill O'Reilly. And this is years ago, but it kind of foreshadows things to come, so why'd you start it that way? <laughs> it's, it's a good question. So, for me, that was, I saw that interview for the first time, and I was shocked. Mm. Because there's, again, you're seeing like two minutes in the film is hours of Mike yeah. and O'Reilly going at it. And for me, it was a kind of the changing of the guards. An interview that you kind of saw there's two uh, figures, prominent figures of journalism, and every one of them kind of represented a different approach. But in that interview, O'Reilly calls Mike uh, his biggest influence. Yeah. He basically calls him the reason why he's doing his show. So I found that interesting, and I also found interesting the response that Mike gave to him, that Mike told him that what he's doing is a lecture. 
right. and not an interview. An op-ed is how he's exactly. he calling it, yeah. And I felt like that's a good opening point to start our film at, where we kind of go more deeply into what makes a good interview, what makes a good question. And I felt like O'Reilly was kind of, you know, the right point to start the Absolutely. discussion. Absolutely, yeah, no question about it. And even just the two of them watching O'Reilly's footage and having Wallace comment on it, yeah. knowing that O'Reilly was influenced by him, but it really goes to show that O'Reilly can be influenced by Wallace, but he took it in a totally different direction. For sure. That didn't look anything like Mike Wallace. Which always happens, yeah. right? The revolution kind of starts with this right. big, good idea, and then the copycats and the time kind of takes that idea and usually muddy it up. And, and I feel like O'Reilly took that idea of being direct and definitely so colored it in a different color, which is yellow, right. and made it a different thing. And I think Mike was very different from that. I don't think he can really be responsible for O'Reilly. No, that wasn't his style or his no. MO, that's for sure. And he really had his whole thing going when he was doing Nightbeat. I mean, that was just great to see Mike Wallace kind of starting up and doing his thing. So what fascinated you the most about looking back at Nightbeat? Nightbeat is amazing. Great I mean, show. Really, yeah. really amazing. Listen, this is 56, mm -hmm. 1956. Smoking cigs on Smoking the set. Smoking cigarettes, <laughs> black and white film. Uh, it was a local station in New York. It was a national. Mm, the Mike right. Wallace interview became national right. after that. And it was just revolutionary at the time. Nobody asked tough questions. It was all, and then I sang, and then I played, and then I, etc. Nobody asked the tough questions. And Mike was for the first time, making people kind of squirm in their seat. Actually challenging people. Yeah. Challenging them, trying to get behind the facade, trying to get into the core of the subject. And those are amazing because the thing that's amazing about that is that it's a kind of a culture of conversation that we lost. Those conversations, the openness of them, the rawness of them, two people just going at it, talking, you know what I mean? You don't see it anymore. No. Today people are so trained. There is PR agents, everybody has his own angle that he wants to push. But back then it was just the beginning of this thing, the television interview, the tough interview, and you saw real emotion in it, and those materials are amazing. If I could, I would do a full movie about that. I'm sure you could have plenty of footage for that. It's amazing. And you mentioned the whole PR training thing. Like There are people sitting there, and they just weren't responding. Like yeah. Today, people would obviously have the responses. Wallace is going after them. <laughs> They're just sitting there. Shock. They didn't know how to <laughs> respond. Yeah. And that was really the big thing for him, because nobody else had been doing this. He's asking tough, direct questions, and then it was just funny seeing some of these pe people just cower in fear over yeah. what was happening on the screen. And that was the power of yeah. it. I think it was the first. Mm -hmm. It's always the first that makes the most splash. Absolutely. So when you think about Mike Wallace as an interviewer, obviously we know his style, but what else do you think separated him from some of the other greats out there? He had, I don't even know how to say it exactly, but he had this ability of unsettling an interviewer. Like, what's a good question, right? Like, when you think about it, what, what makes a good question? I find a lot of the times the good question is what takes uh, the interviewee out of his comfort zone. Mm -hmm which makes him for a second kind of give you an answer that he's not completely prepared for. Right. And Mike was a master of that. He would unravel the subject, and you see it in the raw footage from the beginning of the interview. Before the, the interview even began, he would start to nag at him and would start to make him unease. Right. And then he would give him a question from the right to kind of throw him off the balance and stuff like that. So I think Mike was really a master of catching someone off guard and a master of understanding what makes someone tick. I mean, I think he did that with Larry King, as yeah. he showed in the film. He did that with Oprah as well. And there are people that are very experts. successful in being experts in asking questions. And it was also really interesting because once the tables were flipped and he was getting the questions, he was extremely uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, he's human. Yeah. At the end of the day, we're all very uncomfortable when someone is attacking us in our weak spots. We're talking about ourselves. We're talking or about ourselves or exposing ourselves. Nobody wants to do that. I do think that Mike, at the end of the day, answered all those questions, mm -hmm. but... He they're, was human. Right, and they were tough, and obviously talking about his son Peter and yeah. uh, having to deal with that. I mean, that's a part of Mike Wallace's story that I had never heard of before. Me too, before that movie, yeah. So what was it like uncovering that and, and really giving that the time in the film that it deserved? I think Mike obviously always talks about it as his tipping point in a way. That's the moment where he decided that he's not going to do any more fluff mm -hmm. or fluff or commercials, right. and he's going to do just real serious journalism. But for me, I find it as a more symbolic kind of moment where Michael was the master of the hard question, the direct question. And, but he also did it in, to himself. And I think the death of Peter was a moment where Mike asked himself the tough question. 
where something like that, a tragedy like that happens to a man, I don't, I'm, and I'm going to recap shortly what happened sure. there, just not to ruin the, the scene. Go for it. Mike had a son, Peter. He was 19 years old. He went to travel in Greece, and he disappeared. Nobody heard from him. And Mike, being the investigator that he is, decided to, flew, to fly to Greece to investigate. And while he was in Greece, he found the body of his son lying uh, just dead, mm. which is like the most heartbreaking thing you can Can't imagine. Can't even imagine. Yeah. And a, a thing like that can make or break you. Uh, most people break by something like that, but some people take that energy and can f tunnel it into a change. And Mike asked himself the tough question after that, and that question was, what are you doing with your life? Why are you wasting your time doing commercials and stuff like that? And then that's the point where he decided that he's going to be a serious reporter, and that's, I think, is, it shows what a tough question can do, mm. what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to be a moment of reflection. And the tough questions are intended not to be sensationalism. They're intended to reflect on truth and to, and to get a person to say something, you know, that he doesn't want to admit. And when Mike asked himself, why are you wasting your life? He had to admit that he is wasting his life. And then he made a change and became the reporter that we all know. Yeah, there were a lot of tough questions he had to answer. And he had this relentless effort in terms of the way he went about his work. But he also battled depression. And he also tried to kill himself. And yeah. I thought it was really fascinating how you put it in the film because there's multiple times he's asked that question. He doesn't answer it. Finally, when talking to Morley Safer, he answers the question. Why do you think he answered it there as opposed to all those other times? I think, first of all, he and Morley were colleagues. They were guys. They were boys, years. yeah. Yeah, and I think he wanted to give it to Morley at the end. And I think it was a, a beautiful moment between those two legends. But also, I think he... He got older. It was finally okay to admit that you're weak. That, you know, depression back then when Mike had it was a dirty word. It's not like today where you can talk about exactly. things. Exactly. Men yeah. don't cry. Right. Those were stuff that, especially the tough guy like Mike Wallace, nobody ever was going to be like, oh, Mike Wallace, he tried to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It yeah. was unheard of back then. And I think times change and Mike changed. And I think it finally came to a moment where he was like willing to accept what happened and to admit it and to maybe help some other people with that as well. Yeah, definitely. So when you think about the history of news, there have been a lot of great partnerships. Don Hewitt, Mike Wallace, those guys were simpatico. Yeah. Why do you think it works so well? I think Mike was Don Hewitt alter ego, mm. basically. And I think it just fitted. So Don really created with Mike this show that never existed before that kind of took journalism into a much more uh, commercial route. But people got to understand that television made journalism commercial. The moment television came into the picture and journalism had to compete with other shows in it, right. it had to add a dimension of drama, a dimension of showmanship into it. Entertainment. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what Don and Mike did, basically. And they just fitted very nicely together because Mike was the on-camera guy mm -hmm. and Don was the off-camera guy. And they worked perfectly together to create this... What, what basically is the staple today for journalism? Absolutely. I mean, you mentioned it in the film, there's so many different networks that copy the whole magazine thing, yeah. 2020 after that. Israel, all the news shows. I'm sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, people want more in-depth coverage like that, and they want people to be asked those uncomfortable questions. Of course. And especially, like, the part with Putin towards the end of the yeah. film. I mean, there's a guy who hasn't gotten a lot of tough questions in his day, and seeing Mike Wallace, even though he's at the end of his road there, challenging Putin, like, yeah. it applies to what's going on today. So... What was it like kind of unpacking that moment with Putin? Maybe my favorite moments in the film. Why is that? So, yeah, because Mike was 87 yeah. in that m interview with Putin. And just seeing at him go at Putin at 87 and just not holding back, you know what I mean? Just going head to head with him. And that moment where he's telling Putin, is Russia a democracy? And anything, you, you, you need money in Russia for right. everything. This is like what you dream to see an interviewer ask Putin. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And he does it. He basically manifests your dream <laughs> scenario when you're sitting on the couch, your dream question, mm -hmm. and asks it. So for me, again, just a reminder of how good he was. Definitely. And he also had those moments, too, where he took on major legal challenges as well when it yeah. came to tobacco or when it came to Vietnam. So what was it like for you, you to... know all the film by heart. Yeah, I mean, I watched it last man. night, you know? I got to know my stuff here talking yeah. to you. Listen, the Westmoreland libel suit, yeah. which was a huge one back in the 80s. It was monstrous, yeah. Yeah. It was, again, like a president lawsuit. 
uh, it, it created this um, event that informed a lot of the stuff that we see today. Because News Corporation became very weary of doing more exposés, doing more things that kind of can expose them to libel suit. And Mike went into a big depression in, mm. in that situation. I feel like his core, which was, I'm going to be a respected journalism, was threatened in that moment. He was exposed as, a, as an actor, as someone right. who didn't write his questions. And I think he, he was afraid that he's going to paint his legacy that way. And it hit him very hard. And it hit journalism very hard as well. And I think that story is kind of still looming around journalism today because it was one of the biggest one in the beginning. And it created this situation where journalists were afraid to go at the story without, you know, thinking about twice. Yeah, or just being a puppet. Like that one moment that you say, it's like, yeah. wait, 75% of the questions are written for you. So what does that make you? Yeah, exactly. And that's, again, like you said, kind of the theme of his life, the tough questions that he had to answer while he's asking all these tough questions. And, but Mike, again, Mike was truthful enough to say that now he's afraid. He says it, that part of the reason why he was depressed, that he's been asking people tough questions all his life, mm -hmm. but now he's afraid that people are going to ask him that. Right. So at least he was honest enough to say that he's afraid of that. Definitely. So Mike could obviously see what was coming in terms of the changes in media. Obviously, things have changed with President Trump and just the way things have gone the last couple of years. What do you think he would make of today's media landscape? That's a tough question to answer because Mike is dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think in many ways, Mike was a contrarian. That was his main thing. He was the opposite of what a person against him said or talked. So I think he would be against it today. And I think no journalist cannot not be against it because in the situation where today, journalism credibility is on stake. There are so many outlets today. You, it's really hard to know who to trust, what to hear. People are going into their more, I would say, leaning into their more uh, palatable news mm -hmm. rather than you know questioning what they're hearing. And I think Mike would go against it. But I also think that Mike would enjoy seeing so much news. Mm. There is something amazing about how much people want the news, how much people how crave How much people it. are watching. Yeah, how yeah. much people crave the news. And which was nothing, when, it, when Mike started, news was like <laughs> no rating, nothing. No, it wasn't the main thing. Exactly. And now there's major events around 60 minute interviews and it really gets the attention that it deserves. And especially with social media too, pushing yeah, it out to millions of people. Yeah. Whereas like you had to sit down and watch Mike Wallace on Sunday nights. That's not the case anymore. It's true. Yeah. So when people check this out, what's the big takeaway you want them to have about Mike Wallace? I think it's a big takeaway about Mike Wallace, but about everything. I think it's very important to understand how things came to be. And I think Genesis story that tells us how we got to a place mm -hmm. are critical. I think a lot of us are walking around not understanding where we're living, how, we, how things came to be. And Mike Wallace tells the story of how things came to be the way we see them today. And I kind of want them to see it and to understand that this is not a vacuum that we're living in today. This has history. This has people like Mike Wallace that basically made the legacy that we see today in news. And a guy who was never afraid to ask a tough question. Of course. Avi, thanks so much. Thank you, man. It was a pleasure. Why don't you tell everybody when they can check out the film? The film airs 26th in July and going out to theatrical release. There you have it. That's Avi. I'm DJ. See you next time. You're on the sit down.